Thanks very much. Thanks, Sonia. Great to be uh, uh, talking to a, a new book here at this uh, conference. Uh, uh, it's always a pleasure to see so many engaged people. I want to talk about, uh, on the theme of the conference, uh, power, and in particular, this uh, issue about what a technological change does to the distribution of power and whether we can actually uh, forecast it and what our ability or not to forecast it implies for whether we are going to be able, what sort of policies we should do. So this is very much, this is a very much a policy oriented book. It's talking about political debates, talking about economic debates, and it's talking about policy responses. And so the book's entitled Innovation Plus Inequality. As you'll see, uh, the reason for the plus is because uh, we don't think there's a big trade-off between these things, as many do. Uh, of course, the subtitle is How to Create a Future that is more Star Trek than Terminator. So people have now called this the Star Trek book, which is excellent. I love appropriating that. Uh, and the reason we initially wanted the subtitle to be How would you create a future that's more the Jetsons than the Connors? Um, uh, and the, the publisher says no one remembers who the Jetsons are. Uh, I'm not sure they remember who the Connors are. They more think about the Connors as being this, which will, of course, led us to the Star Trek and Terminator analogy. And the Star Trek analogy is that we have uh, technologies that basically have solved the economic problem, that you can replicate anything material whenever you want, and uh, the robots are more like this than like the description that you got in Terminator. Um, and so that sort of translates the basic ends of the spectrum regarding what we expect to have happen to society from technology. But actually, the motivation for this was, this is myself and this is my uh, co-author. You can see uh, he's a, a politician, and he's also one of those politicians who runs marathons, which you can also see in that picture. Um, <laughs> and, but uh, prior to being a, a, a politician in Australia, Andrew Lee was uh, uh, an economics professor who wrote, wrote with some of the top people on inequality. He was a researcher on that and on the economics of education and so on. And I, of course, uh, study innovation. And so we had this idea the last time we met uh, a few years ago that maybe we should combine these things because they were coming up. And in particular, one of the motivations is, of course, the natural one. The inequality is rising. It's rising in the US, uh, but it's also rising in uh, Canada as well. The, uh, interestingly enough, and this is an important fact, is that the inequality is not as pronounced in, in Canada, yet it has been rising at the same sorts of rates. It's a different base, but it's rising the same sort of rates. But that should tell us something because on a lot of these debates, what, we're de what the US is debating is whether they should become more like Canada in terms of uh, taxation and other things. And that's of relevance here to people thinking about findings in innovation and so on. But I was motivated in particular by a quote that came from an essay by this fellow. This is Paul Graham. He is the founder of Y Combinator. Uh, the, the major startup uh, that is now second in the world to the Creative Destruction Lab. Um, he, he writes, <laughs> on the metric that I'm in my mind, um, <laughs> and, and in a Jay's rhetoric. Um, um, so he writes these essays, and in one of these essays a few years ago, he said, he proclaimed, he was confessing his sins. I am a manufacturer of economic inequality. Why was he saying that? He was saying that because he's funding all these startups and what they're doing is creating rich people. So he is therefore creating economic inequality. So he went into a big diatribe of why, why you know, yeah, sure, it's doing that, but this is a good thing because we're getting all these innovations. This is a typical regard. So don't, don't take away our wealth, you will lose our innovation. Um, I actually had a student look at this uh, to see whether it's actually true that he was creating economic inequality because it wasn't 100% obvious. And Astrid Marinoni, who's a student PhD on the job market, she actually looked at uh, uh, things across the United States and showed there is a correlation. Uh, places where you have higher entrepreneurial quality and more ventures being done actually do end up having more uh, inequality on a variety of measures. So that does actually happen. So what happens, how do we trace this through to really explore this statement and whether it is, uh, whether it is, not whether it is true, but whether it has to be true, whether we could have a world where that doesn't happen. So we have a new innovation, and the new innovation comes in, and it has a couple effects. One effect is, of course, it will create rich people. 
The other effect, of course, which Paul Graham wasn't talking about, is innovation has negative consequences. It's disruptive, it shifts power, as the J says, and so it creates poorer people as well. Some people who were previously well off become less, less so. Now, let me, we call this in the book the creation price and the destruction price for innovation. The creation price meaning we have to give some people more in order to induce them to get, do more innovations. The destruction price meaning any innovation comes the things that have costs and benefits and distributional consequences, and so we have to pay that. And of course, like uh, good economists that we are, we want to think about ways as can we reduce the price destruction and creation of innovation, um, and that way we'll probably get more innovations. So let me analyse the Paul Graham one first, which is that innovation leads to more wealth inequality. Now, the issue isn't whether it leads to more, uh, you know, higher rich, uh, more greater proportion of rich people, but whether you need a greater proportion of rich people in order to get more innovation. So the way I like to think about this is inspired by this, the Drake equation. The Drake equation is an equation that was dreamt up by Frank Drake, which was trying to estimate why we haven't been contacted yet by alien civilizations. I told you we're getting Star Trekky, and then you saw so it was going to come in here. Okay, um, so why? Um, well, because you have to do a calculation of what is the probability that there exists a spacefaring civilization out there, and that's a multiplicity of a number of factors, most of which are unknown. And so you can actually, uh, and that came uh, to this Drake equation, which is the, what are the number of communicating civilizations in our galaxy? This way of thinking is the way we should also approach whether the returns to, say, becoming an entrepreneur and doing all the things involved in that. And so it came with an equation here. And this is an equation that basically uh, takes the possible return, which is big R there. Yeah, I know it is 922 and we're doing mathematics. Yes, we are. We can't avoid it here. So the possible return is big R there. Um, and that is a function of whether you, whether you have an idea, that means how many ho uh, good ideas are hopping into your head, how many of those, uh, the number of strategies that you can uh, use to take any given idea that seems promising and bring it to market, which as CDL tells us, is very, very large. And also some unknowns. The probability that any of these ideas happen to be uh, good or even feasible uh, and the probability that any of these strategies are going to work out and allow you to commercialize. And so that is what gives you your total expected return. So you've got a possible return, the billion dollars you're thinking of, but of course you have to de discount that according to all these uncertainty, which means before the fact, before you decide to become an entrepreneur, you're facing an actually much lower return in expected terms. Okay? And so we have to then look at the impact of tax on that Situation. So if you have a 10% increase in, in the tax on overall wealth, which is essentially what we would get from moving from the United States to Canada, um, people tend to think, oh, that would move a billion dollars and make it 900 million, how much investments would we deter? But that's not actually true. It'll move from, from a much lower amount, a mere fraction of that, to a, something almost the same because of that wealth of uncertainty going on in the middle. And it's even better than that. You take that expected return, it's not like you were going to become an entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur and the alternative was you were going to become some hippie somewhere doing nothing. Actually, that was Steve Jobs, but everybody else, no. It's, the alternative is that you go and work on Wall Street and you earn some money there. And so you have to compare the returns to becoming an entrepreneur to the returns of what you get on Wall Street. And look at that. Here's some more mathematical magic to you. The tax rates cancel out. The tax rate's not going to influence that margin, okay? Nobody's deciding to become an entrepreneur. I've never met one who said, I looked at the tax rate and I decided I wasn't going to do that. Now, that doesn't mean that when they become rich, they won't find ways to, to avoid and evade taxes. We expect that. But the point is, that's not the margin I really care about. The margin I care about is what do we do at the beginning in encouraging these things at the first place? And the economics tells us there's not much reason to think that that's going to be a big trade-off. And now, that's a radical proposition because in all this discussion about inequality and what we can do about it, the one thing even people on the left have seemed to have agreed upon, that is that if we increase taxes, we might get left fewer Steve Jobs. Um, but the economics doesn't tell us that, and it's not just theory, it's evidence as well. 
very recent study, looked at all the tax records, these people looking at all this and all the patent records, matched them together, and found basically the top income tax rates have limited potential to increase, uh, uh, if you reduce them, to increase in innovation. What drives innovation, they found, was childhood exposure to innovation. Childhood exposure, there's two streaming rooms sitting there, which uh, the reason they're there is predicated on this work because we believe that exposing uh, kids to innovation is going to do that. And moreover, how many kids get exposed to innovation? Not much. If you can double the kids exposed to innovation, you will likely double the number of innovators. That's a pretty good margin for policy. Okay? The best inventors aren't impacted by taxation. And if you want to increase innovation, you want to increase this exposure when young, and you want to directly increase skills to increase inventor supply because the costs that are not uncertain are the costs of getting into this in the first place. Okay, so that's that margin. What about this margin? Do we need uh, uh, bad consequences of innovation? Do we have to rest with a destruction price? Well, this goes the other way. Innovation causing issues. Innovation causing issues. And in AI, that comes up all the time. Every technology invents its benefits and costs. So the benefit of a scooter, nice micro-mobility, low impact on the environment, et cetera. And the costs, this. Scooters all over the place. This we haven't had here in Toronto yet, but there are places in the United States that have that. Similarly, we have technologies that uh, come into place. A Roomba. And when do we think a Roomba is good? A Roomba is good when it replaces you having to do housework. When do we think a Roomba is bad? When it replaces somebody who is, we're paying to do housework. That should give you pause. We shouldn't have different feelings about the impact of technology based on whether someone is doing it in their home versus whether somebody is being paid to do it in somebody's home. We shouldn't have a different impact. It should have the same result. And similarly, this comes up. We have recent uh, studies of coders who are programming themselves out of a job. They work out how to make things more efficiently. There was this uh, person, uh, he wrote that within eight months of arriving in a quality assurance job, he had fully in automated his entire work workload, and he was spending 40 hours a week paying, playing computer games instead of actually working. No one noticed because, of course, he was still doing his job. Okay? That shouldn't be any different in some sense of what we... Uh, as to somebody else coming in and, and displacing it. He's displaced his own job, but we feel a bit differently about these ones. We have companies that are doing this currently now, reducing dramatically the amount of labour. Kira is a Toronto-based company that is doing it in the case of legal and reading contracts and using AI to do that. You take paralegals and you reduce their amount of workload by 90%. Ada, uh, one of the CDL companies, took a chatbot to Asia Air and reduce the waiting time for customer service by 98% in the first month. You can't tell me somebody's looking at the number of customer service agents out there and saying, I don't need those people anymore. Okay? So these are consequences that occur. So, and as Jay already mentioned, we had the situation with the uh, taxi drivers. And the important part about that is uh, that the taxi drivers, um, we were uncertain. When the iPhone was delivered in 2007, no one sat there and said, well, that's curtains for the taxi industry. That was completely uncertain, okay? And this is a challenge that we face. We don't know where the cost will be. So the solution often posited is, regardless of whether you're optimistic or pessimistic about technology, what you need to do is have more education. Two different sides of the debates did that. And, and the way we think about it in, in terms of economics is, we think about it as the same way as we think about international trade. International trade is a thing that we generally think is good, but it also has costs and benefits, different people impacting. So if you think about AI, we want to imagine a situation where what you were doing was you were uh, uh, trading suddenly with a country called Robotlandia. And Robotlandia uh, is a new country and it's full of robots, and do you want to trade with it or not? And the answer would be in those terms generally yes. You want to do that, even though there might be consequences. Okay, I know I'm slightly over my time, but I want to make one point. Just a bit of hope. The book talks about optimism versus pessimism. Here's why I'm optimistic regarding artificial intelligence and the human factor in replacing jobs. Look at this. This is the Google search page. You probably don't think about it very much, but it's a very expensive piece of real estate. And in that real estate, they've got a toolbar there a search bar with a button called Google Search and another called I'm Feeling Lucky. You probably don't even notice the I'm Feeling Lucky. You, you don't notice it because it's been there all the way from the beginning of Google. 
What does that button do? Instead of taking you to a page full of results, that button takes you to the first result on Google. We've had 20 odd years of Google. No one feels lucky. <laughs> no one feels lucky. Google, the top AI company in the world, has not been able to make us feel lucky, has not been able to substitute our own judgment in terms of what we would do. That's why I'm optimistic about the future of humanity. Thank you. <laughs>